uh, uh, which uh, who is working at the Power and Flow Group at the Department of Mechanical Engineering in the Eindhoven University of Technology. He is jointly responsible for the Zero Emission Laboratory, which hosts several experimental setups to study ultra clean engines and the fuels of the future. Uh, his key areas of expertise include high pressure sprays, internal combustion engines, field technology, combustion, high speed optical diagnostics, and laser based measurement techniques. Um, he will introduce you to uh, introduce to us uh, today his uh, webinar titled "Internal Combustion Engines Research in the TUE Zero Emission Lab." So um, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much for um, willing to give us this webinar today. All right, thanks a lot uh, for the nice uh, introduction, Claudia. All right, so let's get started um, with a couple of slides that I prepared for today. Um, so today I will introduce, first of all, the Zero Emission Laboratory to you, with a little bit of the vision and the organization of our lab. Um, I will introduce the, the, let's say, the majority of the setups that we host in the, inter, uh, in the Zero Emission Laboratory, and then I will quickly shift gears to capture some of the recent and the current work that we are, uh, well, performing in our Zero Emission Laboratory. And if there's some time left, I will give a quick reference uh, to some of the, uh, you know, the, the connecting computational fluid dynamics work that is also part of the Zero Emission Laboratory initiative, uh, other than the building itself, of course. I don't want to spend too much time on uh, the vision, uh, but of course this is all governed by, let's say, the European Union fun funded uh, mission D+, which try to, yeah, it tries to guarantee emission-free, future-proof mobility for people and goods by 2050. And in this uh, graphic here, you can see how that is targeted with different, uh, let's say, goals uh, to, to reach this by 2050, uh, both in terms of public transport, zero emission zones in, in larger cities, but also the increased share of electric vehicles um, and the increased share of renewable energy in mobility in general. So the vision that we have uh, related to this mission D+, uh, funded by the European Union, is to have internal combustion engine 0, 0.0, so ICE 0, 0.0. And what we mean by that is that we want to have zero impact greenhouse gas emissions. And that's, of course, heavily connected to the fuels that we use, being, for instance, hydrogen and ammonia, or advanced e-fuels and biofuels, as well as local emissions, right? So zero impact pollutant emissions, and that relates to NOx, soot, <laughs> hydrocarbons, and CO emissions. And in this case, of course, these emissions are largely connected to the combustion concepts that we use, as well as the fuels that we use. That brings me to the general vision of our lab, uh, where we think that the combination of ultra-efficient internal combustion engines and sustainable fuels are both key to accelerate greenhouse gas emission reduction and heavy duty transport. And associated with that are yeah, several key scientific challenges, such as how do we make sure that we have the correct in-cylinder mixture formation inside an engine? How do we make sure that the heat release inside a combustion chamber is yeah, shaped optimally and controlled optimally during operation of such an engine. And finally, also, we have to make sure that we are flexible in terms of the fuels that we use or can use, at least inside an internal combustion engine. Well, what does the lab look like? Well, we have different pillars that we focus on. We have concept studies on engines. Uh, we have advanced experiments on combustion. Most of them are also optically accessible, so optical experiments. And then we finally, we also have within the Zero Emission Laboratory Initiative, we have advanced numerical analysis of combustion. And here are some of the associated people uh, that are related to these pillars within the Zero Emission Laboratory. Well, we're not the only ones involved in this lab. So here on the top end side, we see different, let's say, TRL levels. So at the university, we focus mostly on the combustion fundamentals, partially also the modeling, a little bit of the control. But as soon as it moves more towards the application, TNO and DOF are more and more involved, and they are also part of the Zero Emission Laboratory Board and the Program Advisory Committee, including also Shell. So also Shell is involved in the board and the Program Advisory Committee. 
And then finally, of course, yeah, we also have the indispensable help by many other support staff, staff members and PhD students and yeah, students that do a project with us. Then I have a, a movie and I think the sound should also play uh, on your uh, on your own system. So make sure that the sound is uh, properly turned on. Otherwise, you can probably also not hear me uh, that it will play and it will run for approximately one minute after which I will continue. The pursuit of a sustainable future. It's a journey on a road we discover along the way. No clear destination, no beaten track to follow and hardly any time left on the clock. All we know for sure now is we simply cannot make it without internal combustion engines. Especially in heavy transport, these engines are indispensable. Here in the Zero Emission Lab, we explore, we test, and we log our journey. Our research focuses on green fuels and clean engines. More efficient, less emission, simple as that. Yet one of the biggest challenges of our time, let's dive deep into the most fundamental problems we can find. Care to join us? All right, so in the movie, you've already seen a couple of the setups that we host in our lab, and I've laid them out all in this uh, in this graphic uh, here as well. So on the y-axis, we see how close these setups are to the real-world application, while on the x-axis, um, I'm representing the fundamental nature of the research itself. Um, with the green and the blue dots, I'm also representing which setups focus primarily on carbon-neutral fuels, uh, as well as ultra-clean engine concepts. Um, and in this presentation of today, I will first introduce several of these setups, which I believe are unique, even on a global scale. Um, and then finally, again, I will uh, show some of the results by our uh, PhD students and students. So it all starts with the fuel and whether we be, are able to use those in our setups. Uh, and before we use them in engines, of course, we need to know, okay, how do these fuels behave? What type of properties do they have? And that means that we also test some of these fuels for lubricity, stability, and also elemental composition uh, so that we know what we are dealing with. Um, and again, that's really to prevent damage to the engines. Uh, it may also be because we have limited batch sizes with some specific uh, future fuels that people are uh, trying to produce. Uh, and it will definitely give some insights in the applicability and the usability of different fuels and or fuel blends. We then have uh, a single cylinder HOTS engine. It's a generator engine uh, with emission and in-cylinder pressure analysis. Uh, this engine is relatively robust. It's compared to some of the other setups, it's, it's, it's very cheap. Um, and it's still fuel flexible uh, while it is a direct injection compression ignition commercial setup. Um, we've even expanded this recently because we're now building three HOTS engines on moving frames so that some of our bachelor students in their, uh, yeah, in their bachelor course on, uh, on engines, they can use these uh, setups to test different fuels and look at the emissions and in cylinder uh, yeah, pressure uh, in order to assess the heat release from these engines based on the different fuels, uh, of course, targeting the use of more uh, sustainable fuels in the future. Then we have our PECAR MX-13 single cylinder DOF engine, which is also reactivity controlled compression ignition capable. Um, this means that, yeah, it, it can run ultra clean. Uh, it can be fuel flexible uh, with two fuels that inherently prevent soot formation. So if you look at the, uh, the classical concept on the left hand side for classical diesel combustion, you inject your fuel and that starts to burn. Uh, and if you visualize that in an optically accessible engine, you see these flamethrowers, so to say, uh, caused by the amount of soot that you're producing. In the new concept, we have two fuels. One is a high reactivity fuel, one is a low reactivity fuel. And in that way, we can tune the reactivity of the charge itself so that it is well mixed, but it only starts to burn at the right moment in time when we want it to burn close to top that center. And because of that, we avoid very fuel rich areas. And if we then look at the light coming from the combustion itself, it doesn't have these flamethrowers anymore, but instead the light that you see is really coming from chemiluminescence, meaning that you really prevent soot formation. 
So, as I mentioned, you have a high octane fuel, a low octane fuel. Uh, so this one doesn't want to burn very easily. This one does uh, burn very easily. And then you change the ratio between them and also the timing in order to make sure that you have low emissions with still a lot of control over the phasing of combustion itself. And if you then look at a trade-off between the soot on the y-axis and the NOx emissions on the x-axis, you can really see that if you use this RCCI type of approach, then you can really break this trade-off that you normally have, where you can, for instance, use exhaust gas recirculation to move towards more or less soot. Uh, and in this case, you can go to very low NOx and soot emissions combined with this concept. One of the other setups that we have is uh, the so-called Eindhoven high pressure cell or EHPC. This uh, is a constant volume combustion chamber that we fill with uh, four different gases, acetylene, argon, nitrogen, and oxygen in a sequential fill. And then we ignite this charge um, with two commercial spark plugs. Pressure goes up rapidly over time, and then it comes down very slowly over time, relatively. Um, and at some point, of course, you will cross the conditions that are of interest to you when you're studying uh, whatever happens inside the combustion chamber. Um, that is the moment in time where you inject your fuel, and depending on the exact composition of the gases that you filled initially, you will have a specific pressure, a specific temperature, but also a specific oxygen concentration. So you can go anywhere from 0% oxygen to study, for instance, vaporizing fuel jets, to reacting conditions where you study really the same thing as would be happening inside an internal combustion engines. The densities into, uh, in this setup can go up to 400, uh, sorry, 40 kilogram per cubic meter, um, and that's associated with the temperatures, uh, equates to about 350 bar of maximum pressure with optical axis. And the peak temperatures that we can reach in this vessel are about 2000 Kelvin, partially limited by um, the thermocouples that we want to use in order to measure the temperature very accurately. We have uh, ports of 100 millimeter optical axis and the vessel volume is about 1.3 liter. Well, we use this to study liquid phase fuels, vapor phase fuels, um, combustion itself. So here you see an example of chemiluminescence. Uh, we can also look at species by using uh, laser-induced fluorescence, for instance, um, or soot precursors for laser-induced fluorescence and many other diagnostic techniques. And here are just simple a couple of uh, uh, examples that we've recorded in the past. We also have a more simple constant volume vessel, a commercial ignition quality tester. In this case, that's called the Combustion Research Unit, or CRU. This has a volume of about 0.4 liter, and in this case, we use a preheating of compressed gases in order to treat uh, conditions with pressures up to 60 bar, peak temperatures up to 1050 Kelvin, uh, and oxygen percentages ranging between 0 and 21% oxygen. And in this case, it's a very robust fuel, flexible commercial setup for analyzing the heat release. Optionally, we can also equip this setup with a uh, high-speed camera uh, by using a bore scope from the bottom of the uh, combustion chamber in this case. And we've also extended the use of this setup to be equipped with a dual-circuit heavy fuel oil injector so that we can also steady, uh, let's say, um, yeah, uh, more viscous future fuels uh, coming from pyrolysis processes or something like that. We also have a Eindhoven low pressure cell. Um, again, this is a constant volume chamber. In this case, one liter approximately. We can fill this with compressed gases, nitrogen, helium, argon, whatever we choose. The pressure in this vessel can go up to 50 bar. And we mostly use this setup for hydrogen research where we can use uh, fuels pressures at this moment in time uh, with the injectors that we have up until 100 bar of fuel pressure. Again, we have full optical axis, and in this case, we can study, for instance, the formation of mark disks, uh, but we can also do many mixing and penetration studies, uh, and I'm showing, again, a high-speed Schluren movie here to visualize a hydrogen injection. Then we also have a uh, relatively new setup that allows us to characterize injectors. This is an atmospheric momentum exchange setup. Um, and this allows us to determine very essential parameters that we need in order to model fuel injections, because all the fuel injections that we know in this industry, they have um, yeah, certain loss losses inside the injector itself, which are characterized by loss coefficients. And in order to, to determine these loss coefficients, we do these experiments where we inject our, in this case, helium, but this could be hydrogen, of course, 
onto a force sensor. We have a target in front of this force sensor to measure the force that this, in this case, helium jet has on the sensor itself as a function of time. Well, we can use that to characterize the momentum flow of an injector. If we know how much fuel was injected, we can also correlate that to find the mass flow of the injector, and that allows us to find all the related loss coefficients of a certain injector. In this case, we're, uh, we're using that mostly for hydrogen research. Here on the top, we see a diesel injector, so we can also use it to characterize one of these diesel jets, uh, but we're now mostly using this for hydrogen research. And then one of the final setups that I would like to discuss before going to into some more details of the research is our Proteus um, optical engine. So this is internal combustion engine hydrogen point zero. Um, in, the, in, in the base, this is a single cylinder uh, two liter compression ignition engine uh, from a Proteus Ricardo base. We have installed a DOF MX-13 liner piston and um, let's say uh, MX-13 head, so cylinder head. And this setup has an extended piston and you can see that in the schematic here as well. So it, it, it almost seems like we've separated the top part of the engine and the lower part of the engine in order to extend the piston itself. That is the part that you can see here. And because of that, um, you can have optical axis because you can place a mirror inside this extension um, and then the piston can move up and down without interacting with this mirror itself so that you can use this mirror to visualize whatever is going on inside the engine. And here you can see that from the side where you have this cutout from the, uh, from the base of the engine itself, where you can look into the engine here in the top because of this 45 degree mirror. Uh, we can equip then the piston with a quartz or a sapphire uh, window. We can adjust the compression ratio of the engine itself, and we uh, have now, uh, or we have now at least, uh, managed to uh, to provide a software system that allows for flexible skip firing uh, to reduce the thermal loading on the engine itself. So we can, for instance, have the engine running uh, and then only inject our fuel one out of ten cycles, so to say. Okay, so then I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, some research and uh, sorry, some recent and current work. Um, I will discuss four projects. The first one is the Smart uh, Smart CHP project, combined heat and power. Um, this was our PhD student Yu Wang who defended his PhD thesis on the 28th of May, so a couple of months ago, and his target uh, was to really use fast paralysis bio oils in engines, so FPBO uh, in short. The second project is uh, a project associated with the Zero Emission Laboratory itself uh, and the rebuilding of our lab uh, in combination with a you know, internal call of the university. Uh, so some different parties are involved as well. And this is really the rebuilding of the final setup that I introduced, uh, which is our optical engine, which we will rebuild and repurpose for um, hydrogen uh, internal combustion engine use. Um, and that's our PhD student, Stan Lottem. Then uh, the third project will be that of uh, Max Peters, which is part of the Vici project of uh, Professor van Ooyen, uh, which is called the Argon Power Cycle, uh, in which Max Peters is visualizing and characterizing hydrogen jets in several of our setups. And then finally, I will discuss a couple of results from uh, our uh, CSC student, uh, Zongcheng Sun, who is really investigating the path, uh, the short and long-term future of, of engines, uh, looking at for future fuels, including biofuels, as well as uh, oxymethylene ethers, which can be a biofuel or a advanced e-fuel in the future. So within the SMART combined heat and power project, the idea is that we have non-food biomass residues uh, that we use in a pyrolysis plant in order to produce fast pyrolysis bio oil. And then we have a smart CHP system which consists of a modified diesel engine as well as a flue gas boiler uh, with the technical goals that we had for this project listed here. So small scale, 100 to 1000 kilowatt electric, um, flexible heat to power ratio, so one to one to 10 to one uh, with an overall combined heat and power efficiency of above 85% and a greenhouse gas emission reduction of above 80% compared to using simply a, a fossil fuel engine. And then the target is to provide both heat and electricity uh, to industry, service sectors, islands and remote areas, or for instance, district heating. Well, FPBO has some properties that are very different when compared to diesel, and I'm showing some images here on the right hand side. It has a very high viscosity. It has a very low energy density compared to diesel. It has a high oxygen and 
high water content and it may also contain some impurity particles and it is also in, uh, on top of that very uh, acidic. That means that we're, we're facing some challenges when we want to use this fuel in a engine uh, because we also have some unknown ignition and combustion characteristics. Uh, the fuel is corrosive, it may lead to nozzle clogging and it, uh, yeah, it may be difficult to ignite this fuel in the first place. Right, so in order to let yeah uh, to see if we could use this fuel in our engines, um, he used a threefold approach where he investigated the ignition, the combustion, and the fuel recipes uh, in blends in our constant volume combustion chamber, the CRU in this case. He also applied modeling where he used uh, a uh, yeah a two stage Lagrangian model to study ignition as well as the impact of fuel composition. And then finally, he did engine experiments to assess the durability of the engine running on FPBO and FBO blends, as well as to study the emission and efficiency of the engine itself. So really going from the fundamentals to the, uh, yeah, uh, the applicability. So these are one of the very early results where we noticed uh, that when we were using neat FPBO at an injection pressure of 300 bar, uh, well, with uh, several injections. So on the left-hand side, we see a movie uh, of the lum luminosity coming from combustion from diesel. And then on the right hand side, the two movies there show examples of injections of FPBO. And we noticed that uh, even after several injections, the injector started clogging, meaning that we would only see three and eventually only two more fuel sprays coming from this injector itself. We saw poor atomization and also a very short burn duration when compared to diesel. And if we then look at the heat release as a function of time on the graph in the right hand side, we can indeed see that the amount of heat being released from the injections also decreased with the amount of injections that we did in our constant volume vessel. Well, luckily we found some solutions to this. So first of all, by increasing the injection pressure rather significantly to 900 bar, we noticed that we had a significantly improved nozzle durability. We also improved the atomization. And in fact, we saw that eventually even the amount of light coming from combustion was reduced, indicative for reduced soot emissions as well. If we then added 30% uh, of uh, ethanol, we further improved the atomization, we further reduced the soot intensity, and we also slightly shortened the ignition delay, meaning that these fuels or these fuel blends were even easier to implement in engines. With this uh, simulation efforts, he looked at the extension of a existing two-stage Lagrangian model by including a 1D spray model. So the, the, the complete model is essentially shown by this graph. So we have a uh, minimalistic flow model. We assume two perfectly stirred reactors with transport. So that's the flame sheet reactor here on the edge where we have nearly stoichiometric combustion and the core reactor where we have a very fuel rich area um, where we still have some reactions of course going on uh, that eventually lead to the flame sheet reactor. And then we are capable of using detailed chemistry and in fact describe a multi-step ignition process. Uh, I will not go into detail here, but what we noticed is that by this very simplistic model, uh, which requires not that many input parameters, we, will, we were capable of, uh, of reproducing very detailed direct numerical simulation models representative for these fuel sprays that we study in our lab. So we validated that at uh, so-called spray A conditions, which are uh, standardized conditions by the Engine Combustion Network, uh, international collaboration of people working and looking at fuel sprays. Uh, and we really found that this is a very powerful tool to investigate spray ignition processes. Um, eventually, you also applied this to uh, FPBO and FPBO blends, finding that the uh, the ambient temperature required for auto ignition of FPBO is very high, above 1000 Kelvin, uh, and that ethanol specifically promotes the second stage of ignition. Um, so that's why it helps to reduce the ignition delay of the jets when we blend ethanol and FPBO. Then finally, uh, one or two slides on uh, some engine experiments with FPBO. So in this case, there was a dedicated engine setup that was modified in order to run on FPBO. The modifications are listed here. We had to include intake preheating and we had to include an elevated uh, compression ratio. So we had to modify uh, the, the piston in order to elevate the compression ratio. 
Um, there was a fuel switching and dual circuit injection system installed so that we can rinse the fuel system from the FPBO. Uh, and eventually we managed to run this engine for 500 hours in a durability test. And that's for the first time ever in the world that uh, this was achieved when operating on FPBO by making some of these adjustments to the engine. Here are some efficiency uh, results. Uh, I will not go into detail again here, but I will rather go to the conclusions. So in fact, we noticed that there is an increased uh, net indicated efficiency because of the faster burning rates of FPBO. Uh, and in fact, we also managed to decrease the NOx emissions when compared to diesel, but we would uh, see uh, slightly elevated CO emissions. Then the next project is the rebuilding of our optical engine to make sure that we can operate it in the future on hydrogen. Um, I will quickly show the schematic here. So the idea is that we have our optical engine, um, we have our air path, uh, we have injection of water uh, in order to increase the water content inside the engine. And then we have our, heli heli uh, sorry, our hydrogen system here, uh, which is stored outside. Um, and I will show how we'll get to different uh, pressures to inject hydrogen in the port of the engine as well as directly eventually and of course we also still have our traditional diesel fuel system installed here uh, to make use on this engine so essentially we will have 200 bar hydrogen bottles stored outside these will be this will be uh, reduced to 40 bar before entering the lab Inside the lab itself, it will be reduced further to about seven bar for a port fuel injection uh, operation. And then if we want to use direct injection of hydrogen in this engine, uh, we will set the reducer to 40 bar to feed a hydrogen booster, an example shown here on the right hand side. Uh, and using this boot booster, we, uh, we were, will be capable to achieve 700 bar um, of hydrogen pressure. And in fact, we only need about three bar of hydrogen inlet pressure in order to uh, utilize the booster and to allow uh, emptying of the hydrogen packs. So that's again schematically shown here, uh, where we will have a high pressure type four buffer for hydrogen um, that will be used in order to do uh, direct injection of hydrogen. So we use the booster to fill this uh, buffer vessel, and then we can perform our experiments for a certain duration of time. The idea is that we use a stepwise approach. This uh, optical engine has been used running on diesel uh, with compression ignition. Um, that's the easy target, of course, uh, by rebuilding the engine as it was approximately. But stepwise, we will then move towards um, dual fuel operations. So we have um, port fuel injection of hydrogen, uh, and we inject a little bit of uh, diesel to ignite the hydrogen itself. Um, then we aim to go for port fuel injection of hydrogen with a spark ignition system. Then we aim for low pressure direct injection, spark ignition, and then eventually high pressure direct injection, spark ignition, uh, making use of different ignition methods in the end as well. Well, the ignition uh, systems are also relevant when talking about hydrogen uh, engines because, well, hydrogen has a lower minimum spark energy required compared to gasoline. Um, and in traditional gasoline type of ignition systems, you may have some residual energy remaining after the spark itself. And that means that you can have another spark during the exhaust or intake stroke, which of course poses some yeah, safety uh, hazards. Um, and that means that, uh, again, here there are certain steps that we need to take in order to make sure that we uh, avoid these situations in this engine in the future. I will not go in detail here, but this is, a, a, let's say, a transistor controlled ignition system that uh, is very typical for uh, gasoline engines. But what you need is a uh, capacitor discharge ignition system. Um, and that's a very uh, simplified uh, version of that as shown here in the bottom to make sure that you don't have any residual spark uh, inside your uh, system. Um, we have full control over EGR, uh, but not in a way that that happens with a real engine. So exhaust gas recirculation is normally simply the uh, the feedback loop or uh, or the feedback of of exhaust gases into the intake. Uh, but in this case, of course, because we operate the engine on skip firing mode, so we don't fire every cycle. We need to do something else, and that means that we simulate the exhaust gas recirculation by mixing air, nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen and, uh, and water uh, using uh, specific uh, mass flow controllers. Um, well, we also cannot measure 
the EGR percentage as you would do on a conventional engine, because normally that's based on CO2. But in this case, if we aim to operate the engine on hydrogen, then we really need to do something like a oxygen concentration measurements instead. And that's what we're also trying to validate currently on one of our other engine setups. All right, then the next project that I would like to discuss is based on the argon power cycle. And this is the work by Max Peters. So, here we have the traditional uh, system or a traditional situation of an engine where we have air entering the engine. We inject our fuel, which is typically a liquid fuel, and then we have our exhaust, exhaust gases, uh, including some nitrogen oxides. Um, in this case, for a compression ignition engine, um, and the idea of the argon power cycle is that instead of air with nitrogen, we want to use argon because argon is the most affordable non-toxic gas. And because of the fact that it's uh, a monatomic gas, the theoretical thermal efficiency of our engine will get an automatic boost going from 55% to about 80%. And that's shown in the, uh, in the graph here. So basically by making sure that we use argon instead of air, um, we have to also recirculate the argon, of course, because otherwise you keep on uh, emptying argon bottles. Um, and then you have to make sure that you inject both hydrogen and oxygen. In this case, you form only water. You don't form NOx emissions because there's no nitrogen inside. And when you condense the water, then you can actually recirculate the argon. So that is the concept, as long as there are no contaminations, so to say. Well, that will enable uh, pollution-free power production, um, and it will also enable a very cost-efficient, uh, effective hydrogen energy storage and utilization. And again, this is part of the uh, the Vici project project of uh, Professor uh, Van Ooyen. Within this project, Max is, uh, is is really looking at the hydrogen injections. Um, and the first step that we uh, did there was to characterize the needle lift of a modified gasoline injector that we're using to inject our hydrogen. And in fact, what we did there is we, uh, if you look at a cutout from the injector, so we drilled a hole in the side of the injector to visualize the needle inside. Of course, you cannot inject your uh, hydrogen anymore, but you can see the needle using backlight illumination uh, and a microscope in order to visualize the movement of the needle itself. Well, if you then record that with a high-speed movie, then you can determine the actual needle lift as a function of time. And without yeah, showing the rest of the movie, I can quickly go to the results. So here we see the needle lift, uh, which is about, let's say, 75 micron only for such an injector as a function of time. So there's a little bit of bouncing uh, when opening the injector as well as when closing the injector. But in general, there is a very steady 75 micron uh, opening of the injector. And that means uh, that we concluded from this work that the smallest flow area of this injector is in fact really around this needle because of the small amount of lift that such an injector has in order to inject the fuel. And this was also later um, validated in additional experiments where we used a laser Doppler vibrometer to image the movement of the needle from the back end side of the injector. And that's uh, something that we can even do in the future while injecting um, hydrogen, because now in this case, we don't have to cut a hole in the injector itself to visualize uh, the needle movement. All right, so the next step was to look at the jet behavior of these hydrogen jets. And here I'm showing the jet penetration on the y-axis as a function of time in milliseconds. And we've done this for different injection pressures as well as different ambient pressures. And we've confirmed that something that is also found typically in literature for gas jets, that if you fix the nozzle pressure ratio, then it doesn't matter what your injection pressure is. So you fix the ratio between the injection pressure and the ambient pressure these jets will behave in the same way. So if you have a similar nozzle pressure ratio on the order of four in this case, all these jets behave in a very similar way in terms of the jet penetration. Well, this is in nitrogen. Uh, this project is, is all about injections into argon. And here are some differences with argon. So because of the different density of argon, you can notice that if you have the same nozzle pressure ratio for the, let's say the dark blue line, so 2.5, as well as the dashed purple line 2.5. In this case, there is a big difference between different jets uh, because of the ambient in which we are injecting our hydrogen. 
Um, well, there's also a lot of studies uh, related to the mark disc and the barrel shock formation of these gaseous injections. In this case, the, uh, the diameter of the injector itself is about 7.5 millimeter. The orifice in, through which we inject our fuel is about 0.65 millimeter. And you can see that, especially at a very high nozzle pressure ratio of 50 in this case, uh, in the central uh, movie, you can see that you get a pretty large mark disc, but notice that these are in general still very small because you at maximum have about five times the exit diameter of the injector itself. So these phenomena are relatively small, but of course they are interesting to observe and how they behave as a function of different nozzle pressure ratios. Right, so in addition to the jet penetration measurements, uh, we've also performed Rayleigh scattering measurements. Uh, you will have, of course, Rayleigh scattering outside of the jet itself. So we have a laser sheet entering the vessel itself, and then you will have Rayleigh scattering of the ambient itself. If you then have the laser sheet interacting with the jet, you have the combination of the mole fraction of the fuel, as well as the ambient that has already mixed into the jet itself. And that will give a different uh, yeah, amount of really scattering at that location. But of course, we have both of them in a single shot because the laser sheet has to pass through the ambient in order to interact with the, uh, with the jet itself. And that means that there is, when you look at the ratio, then there's only a couple of variables that are remaining. The first of all is the Rayleigh cross section of both the hydrogen as well as the ambient. And the second one is the density field inside the jet itself. So these are the, uh, the unknowns, so to say. Well, the Rayleigh cross sections uh, you can find in literature. You can, uh, the numbers, several numbers are represented here. Um, for, let's say, traditional uh, experiments for diesel like fuels, such as N aptane. The good news is that you have a very high Rayleigh cross section, so it's uh, on the order of 300 in this case, uh, while for hydrogen it's only about one, and that's not that different from the ambience that we are looking at, and of course the ratio uh, provides the signal here. In addition to that, uh, it's also lower than the ambient itself, so that means that we will have reduced scattering signal inside the jet, whereas in the traditional measurements that you find in literature for uh, diesel-like uh, fuel jets, uh, you have a very intense really scattering signal coming from the fuel itself. So it's the opposite in this case. Um, for the density field inside the jet, uh, we went into theory and we looked at, okay, uh, what are the expected pressures and temperatures of the, yeah, the, the, the jets themselves? And here you can find that starting from the location of the mark disk itself, uh, people have found that the ambient pressure is equal uh, to the, uh, sorry, that the, the pressure at the, in the jet is equal to the ambient pressure. And the same thing holds for the temperature. So the temperature at the mark disk can be considered to be equal to the temperature of the ambient. So they have fully already accommodated to the ambient temperature at that moment in time. And that means that the density field inside the jet, in fact, can be assumed to be uh, yeah, unity equal to one. So that's outside of the shock barrel. And we've seen already that this uh, barrel shock is relatively small. So that's good news for characterizing the Rayleigh signal inside the, uh, the jet. And therefore, we can find the mole fraction of the uh, hydrogen uh, and assess the mixing of hydrogen jets in these constant volume vessels. Well, here are some images of the setup. Um, the nicest one, I guess, is here on the right hand side. So we have the laser sheet entering here from, from a slit window in order to avoid scattering as much as possible. Here we see our laser sheet, and then we see indeed the reduced signal of the jet itself. And on the right hand side, we see the beam steer steering effect caused by the density differences uh, inside the jet compared to the ambient. So that leads to the beam steering. Well, here's the same thing with a scientific camera. Again, the laser comes from the left-hand side. You can see the beam steering on the right-hand side. And this is a 100 bar heli uh, hydrogen injection into 10 bar of nitrogen. We also uh, make some corrections. So in this case, the result image on the left-hand side now is the result of uh, subtracting the Rayleigh scattering image on the right-hand side with a vacuum image. And that's essentially uh, in order to correct for the flare uh, that uh, the laser sheet generates inside this, uh, this setup. Well, if we then convert this to mole fractions using the equations that I've shown before, then we see the mole fractions of hydrogen in a snapshot here on the right hand side. But you can still see again this severe beam steering on the right hand side and also inside the jet itself, you see some of these uh, horizontal lines caused by the, the beam steering of the laser uh, caused by the density gradients in the in the setup. 
Well, if we take that image and then we uh, look at the light, the laser light intensity distribution on the left hand side of the jet and on the right hand side of the jet, and we do a, let's say, 1D interpolation over the background. So we make a cutout of the jet and then we do a 1D interpolation. Then we can use that as a background to correct the beam steering uh, artifacts that we see. And that results in an image like now shown in the center approximately, uh, leading to a very nice image to show the mole fractions of hydrogen um, as a function of this uh, hydrogen injection in a certain ambient. Well, here are some more images. So on the left hand side at different timings, we see the, the single shots of hydrogen injections. And then in the center, we see average of 20 or 30 um, injections of hydrogen into our uh, vessel. And then the right most image shows the standard deviation. So it's a very neat way to characterize the mixing of hydrogen. Well, for the argon power cycle, the next step uh, was to characterize combustion as well. Uh, we've done this in our Eindhoven high pressure cell, but of course we measure normally only the pressure inside the vessel. We convert that to a bollock temperature using the ideal gas law. But of course, there is some thermal stratification inside the vessel itself because, well, you have buoyancy effects as well as boundary layers near the vessel walls. And therefore, we do some uh, core temperature measurements. And you see some temperature sensors here inside the vessel. These are small, um, high-speed 50 micron bare wire thermocouples, type R, uh, that we use to measure the temperature at the location where the fuel jet will eventually be. And we've done these characterizations for both nitrogen as well as argon ambients. So we do a pre-burn where we have a mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, um, and acetylene, or argon, oxygen, and acetylene. And then we look at the differences. Well, these are a couple of movies uh, shown from the side with Schlieren and from the top with OH star chemiluminescence. And you can see, if you look carefully, that these flames behave also in a different way, whether uh, we have argon inside the vessel or whether we have nitrogen inside the vessel. And that becomes more clear from these images. So the target condition here in this case was 22.8 kilogram per cubic meter uh, and a temperature of 900 Kelvin uh, at the moment of injection with a peak temperature of 200 Kelvin uh, for the limits of the vessel itself. And in order to achieve these conditions, the profiles of pressure and temperature look very differently. So the, the target here is, is clearly visible, right? So that's the 2000 Kelvin approximately uh, that we reach inside the vessel. It's a little bit lower here, uh, but the target is approximately 2000 Kelvin. We don't want to exceed the 2000. But in order to uh, achieve then the 22.8 kilogram per cubic meter and 900 uh, Kelvin at the moment of injection, we see that we have very different uh, pressure behavior. So uh, you see that the starting, the filling pressure of argon is much lower uh, compared to nitrogen and also the peak pressure of argon is also much lower in order to reach these temperatures. And in fact, we only need 50% of the acetylene in order to reach the peak temperature when we use argon ambience. Right, very recently in the past couple of weeks, we've also started uh, our hydrogen injections into the non-reacting and reacting atmospheres of the Eindhoven high pressure cell. So these are experiments at high temperature. The first one is at 433 Kelvin in 20 bar. And I will play the movie again, but I will first explain that on the left hand side, we have the original Schlieren movie. And on the right hand side, we use a differencing scheme where we subtract the previous image in the recording from the image that we are evaluating. And that improves the, uh, the visibility of these jets. So let me show that movie again. So on the left hand side, it's very difficult to visualize the hydrogen uh, because of the fact that the density gradients are very small. But if you then use this differencing scheme, you can still extract the information that you're interested in. Well, of course, we are interested in higher temperatures. So in this case, the bottom images or the bottom movies show the same injection in a ambient temperature of 1200 Kelvin and in this case 40 bar, but again without oxygen. And I will play those movies now. And because of the fact that the density gradients are now approaching one another even more, so the density of the hydrogen jet itself as well as of the ambient, it becomes very, very, very difficult to visualize the hydrogen jet. And you definitely need the, uh, the differencing approach to, to see the hydrogen jet, but it becomes very difficult to visualize these jets. Life becomes a little bit easier when we move to reacting conditions. So in the top movie, we now see 1000 Kelvin and 40 bar. 
again, the right hand side shows the, uh, the differencing uh, approach, but I would like you to focus on the left image because if we look at this spot right here, we see that at some point about seven, eight milliseconds after the start of injection, this, eight, uh, this 1000 Kelvin ambient results in the auto ignition of the hydrogen jet. And I will play that again, and you can focus on the point where the laser pointer is uh, approximately placed. So the injection starts about now, and it takes up to about seven or eight milliseconds before the hydrogen auto ignites. I guess it will be more like here. And there you see that the hydrogen auto ignites, and because of that, of course, the density changes because the temperature increases very rapidly when combustion starts, and therefore you see uh, where the um, where the hydrogen is combusting. And then finally, uh, at an even higher temperature of 1600 uh, Kelvin, we will have direct auto injection. So I'll play that movie, but you will see that it directly starts to burn. And therefore you will directly see also in the left-hand side movie uh, that you will be able to visualize the, uh, the jet a little bit better again uh, because of the higher temperatures. And especially with the differencing uh, movie, you can definitely see where uh, the combustion uh, is taking place, where the hydrogen jet is burning. All right, there's a little bit of a uh, yeah, dessert of, of really the, the past two weeks uh, in terms of what is going on in the, in the lab. We've now also included uh, OH star chemiluminescence movies. So here on the top hand side, we see a top view of the vessel with the OH star recording. And in the bottom, we see again another Schlieren injection. Here the conditions are slightly different. These conditions are slightly easier in order to visualize the hydrogen jet. Uh, but here you can see how yeah, uh, the jet develops and, and uh, how OH star is being formed in this jet itself. And then as a dessert, we also uh, installed last week a, a color camera uh, showing the, the different colors that you see uh, in an injection of hydrogen. And uh, well, the next question for also us is uh, what are we actually looking at? Because uh, we definitely see some yellow, we see some particles, and uh, the question is now, okay, is this something that is left inside the vessel and then trained into the jet? We still uh, have to uh, evaluate that and assess that. So the final project where we'll spend a couple of slides uh, talking about the work of Zongcheng Sun. Uh, he's looking at, uh, let's say, short to long-term solutions for engines, uh, starting with renewable drop-in fuels. He has been evaluating gas to liquid or GTL fuels. Uh, GTL blends with 30% of FAME, which is a biofuel. And then finally also oximethyl, uh, oximethylene dimethyl ether uh, fuels, which are uh, yeah, definitely synthetic fuels that we uh, are very, very much interesting, uh, interested in. Um, he is using uh, the MX-13 single cylinder engine that we have inside uh, our zero emission laboratory. Here I'm listing some of the fuel properties of the different fuels that he is testing, where you can see that, uh, well, uh, the GTL fuels, they have very uh, similar properties when compared to diesel fuel, uh, although they have a higher CT number, which means that they burn more easily, uh, and they have neg negligible sulfur, sulfur and aromatic uh, content, which means that they burn a little bit cleaner. Um, well, these also have very similar properties as HVO, hydro-treated vegetable oils, uh, and that therefore they can also be regarded as uh, yeah, similar to XDL or anything to liquid type of fuels. So these are synthetic fuels that can be made out of different uh, processes. OMI is a little bit different. Uh, OMI doesn't feature carbon-carbon bonds. It has a very high oxygen content and an even higher CTA number, as you can see here. And uh, that has some very nice properties associated with it, uh, as I will show in the pre uh, upcoming slides as well. Um, because of the fact that it has oxygen, it also has a yeah, significantly reduced lower heating value. So it's only half of the value compared to these uh, diesel-like fuels. And that means that you do have to inject more fuel, of course, uh, in order to reach the same power output for the engine itself. Um, well, I will not go in much detail here, but uh, essentially what Songcheng has found is that if you use these GTL and GTL B30 fuels, that you can again break the traditional soot versus NOx trade-off that uh, diesel engines are confronted with. And these differencing maps here in the bottom, they show the effect of 
uh, let's say the, the subtraction of GTL minus the results from diesel in terms of NOx emissions as a function of EGR and load points on the x-axis. So the load points here uh, are the different uh, load points represented by if uh, the number 30 to 70, where 30 refers to 30% of the maximum load of the engine, and the different letters refer to different engine speeds. So you see a very complete engine map, so to say, in a single figure with different EGR calibrations. Well, if we look at the NOx emissions, in general, we find that with GTL fuels, we can reduce NOx by 16%, while for the uh, GTL B30, so including a lot of biofuel, we can, uh, yeah, we cannot reduce it. In fact, the NOx emissions increase a little bit. However, one of the main findings here was that we really need to optimize the EGR, the exhaust gas recirculation calibration. So we have to make sure that we provide either yeah, uh, more or less oxygen in the combustion chamber in order for these uh, yeah, fuels to run in optimal conditions. Uh, and that means that we really, if we want to use these fuels, it's highly recommended that this is evaluated and the uh, recirculation of exhaust gases is really optimized in order to optimize the performance of these engines. Um, well, I already introduced the OME fuels. Um, they are very, very interesting because they can significantly reduce the amount of soot that is being produced inside an engine. Uh, but the downside is that it, at the moment in time is very expensive to use OME because the fuel itself is a synthetic fuel, which is expensive to uh, produce. So the question that we had here is, OK, so if you have a certain amount of OME, how much do you actually need in order to run an engine efficiently and in a clean way? And if you have a certain amount, uh, do you then fuel several engines with pure OME or do you fuel a lot of them with a certain blend containing a little bit of OME? Well, we selected a certain uh, case based on our, uh, our engine uh, experiments that was the most polluting. So in this case, the B30, so a speed of 1425 RPM with 30% load. Uh, was showing the highest soot and NOx emissions, so we found that the most interesting point to evaluate with our fuels. And Songchen then used a design of experiments approach where he looked at different injection timings, different exhaust gas recirculation ratios, and different blending ratios of OME with diesel in order to provide a comprehensive global emission map. And that is summarized in the figure here on the right hand side. So I realize this is a very busy figure, but it contains a huge amount of information and that is very interesting. So on the Y axis, we have the amount of OME in our fuel blend with diesel. On the X axis, we have the exhaust gas recirculation. So the inverse of oxygen concentration, in fact. And then in the different colors we show, for instance, uh, in the bottom right, the soot emissions. Uh, we show the uh, the gross indicated efficiency of the engine. We show some lines for the NOx emissions and for the hydrocarbon emissions. And we found that using this design of experiments and the resulting map that I'm showing here, that we can really find an optimal uh, between OME concentration and EGR in order to find optimal emission characteristics of this engine. So with OME, we have a slightly negative effect on NOx emissions, but that is significantly mitigated when we reduce the oxygen concentration, when we increase the exhaust gas recirculation, um, while CO is effectively reduced with OME addition. And in fact, what we found from this study is that we can, uh, we can be compliant with Euro 5 NOx emissions and Euro 6 uh, soot emissions when we increase the OME content over 40%. Uh, and we increase the EGR percentage over 37%. And in fact, if we accept uh, exhaust gas recirculation units, so a selective catalyst reduction and a diesel oxidation uh, catalyst, then in fact, we only need 12.5% of OME and 29% uh, exhaust gas recirculation to be compliant with Euro 6 emissions. So that's really nice results, I believe, from this, uh, from this study. I will skip a couple of slides here, which uh, essentially talks again about uh, constant volume combustion vessel measurements of OME and diesel. And I will, let's see, probably show one more slide on the fact that we also do uh, a nice study with methanol and uh, OME, where the idea is that in the future, if we have OME on our vessel or on our truck, 
then it might be possible to also carry or produce a slight amount of OME out of this methanol in order to uh, run dual fuel or reactivity controlled uh, compression ignition. And in this study, we have uh, assumed A70 conditions, but then we only introduced, yeah, let's say uh, a 30% load. So we drew, reduced the amount of fuel that we're injecting using OME. And then by adding methanol in the port, of this inject uh, of this uh, of this engine, we've tried to recover the 70% load point of the engine itself. So we we increased the amount of methanol in order to recover the performance of the engine itself. And in fact, we've managed to do so up until now, up until 59% uh, before we reached the maximum pressure rating of the engine. And if we then use a pilot injection, we can go a little bit further than that. Um, and in fact, we see also 1.5 gross indicated efficiency improvement when going uh, with this dual fuel approach. I guess I'm really out of time now. Um, so the slides here just show some numerical simulations. Uh, that's not part of my work, but that is part of the zero emission laboratory initiative. And that really shows that these results that we find in our different setups are then directly being used to also um, yeah, assess and improve numerical simulations. So I will stop there to uh, leave a couple of minutes for potential questions, but of course, feel free to reach out to me on my uh, on my email address listed here on the slide as well.